Good morning friends and welcome to Castle Hill Baptist Church Online. My name's Kevin Johnson and I'm the pastor here and it's great to welcome you to join me wherever you are as we worship our living God. And we're going to do that by starting today with a song which thinks about all of creation and how that just brings joy to our hearts, how it makes us want to sing How Great Thou Art. So do join with me as we sing together. proclaims how lovely is your dwelling place Lord Almighty my soul yearns even faints for the courts of the Lord my heart and my flesh cry out for the living God 
Even the sparrow has found a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let's pray together. Loving God, we just want to thank you for all of creation around us. That every single part of it matters to you. And whilst we recognise that we live in a broken world, where things are not as they should be, right now we just want to start by praising you for those beautiful things we see. For the changing of the leaves as the weather turns. For the sound of a stream running that brings peace to our hearts. For the sight of the sun. For others, for the beauty of a night sky filled with stars painted by your hand. For the beauty of a sunset or indeed a sunrise. For the sound of birds singing. For the change in all that is growing. Loving God, we thank you that all these things are in your hands. And Lord, in us today, many of us gather because we want to worship you. And we seek to trust in you as our Lord God Almighty. And we recognise that we want to dwell in your house. Not that it's a physical building, but it's knowing that the Spirit lives within us. And so today, Lord, if we're thirsty or if we're hungry, in need of you, Father, would you fill us up? Would you quench our thirst? Would you meet the desires of our hearts? If we're lonely, if we're nervous, if we're anxious, if we're afraid, Father God, would you bring us peace? And help us to know you close to us. And Lord if we're in a really good place. Happy and fulfilled with what's happening at the moment. Lord would you help us to celebrate that with you. To place those things before you. And to thank you for the way that you are working in our lives. May we continue to dwell in your presence. In all seasons of life. And may we give thanks this day to you, as our Lord, our God, and our Saviour. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, last week I introduced our covenant verse for the year. And uh, normally we produce some kind of uh, leaflet uh, which can help remind you of what that verse is. Uh, this year we're obviously working on the idea that we're doing memory verses. However, Kathy has come up with a way that might help it to stick more in your mind. So let's join her for a new idea for a craft this week. Hi everyone. For those of you who are regulars at Castle Hill Baptist Church, these cards will be familiar. They serve to remind us of key Bible verses that we, as a church, have used as a focus for the year ahead. Last week, Kevin, our pastor, introduced us to a verse from Proverbs, which we learnt with the help of a song. Can you remember it? As he was teaching us from the Bible, he explained what the verse meant to the people of the Old Testament by describing a picture. In their early days, as a nation, their towns frequently came under attack from enemies and they needed to have a strong tower. Can you think why? Well, one reason was to place a lookout or a watchman who would stay alert and sound a warning if there was danger of an attack. The people working in the fields would be warned to run to safety. The other reason was to provide a safe place where the people could gather for protection. 
We as Christians are reminded that we too can run to our God for his saving power. He is like that strong tower. Kevin's description gave me a clear image of how we could show that verse in a poster. Have you remembered the verse? Well, here it is. And perhaps you would like to make a poster like this to remind you of it. This is very simple to make. You will need a large piece of paper or card. Wallpaper would do for your background. Some card for the tower. I used part of a cereal box. An A4 sheet of white paper. A pencil and a ruler. Coloured pens or crayons. And finally, some glue and some blue tack. You will need to draw and cut out your tower. Make sure it will fit on your background paper. Make the top edge tower like by cutting out some segments. A fancy word for this is crenellations. We don't need to worry too much about that. Simply cut some segments out of the top. Like this. Colour your tower grey and mark a door. This should be quite large as your people will need to fit through it. Then you need to cut down two sides of the door in order that it will open like that okay above this you need to write the words of the verse or you could print them on the computer and stick them on like that the name of the lord is a strong tower the righteous run to it and are safe Proverbs 18, 10. Now crease the long sides of your tower twice so that you can stick it to the background paper. And this will give it a three-dimensional effect. If there's an adult who can score the creases, it will fold more easily. Now put some glue along the long edges Remember, not the whole tower, just along that long folded edge that you have. Remember to do both sides and then you will be ready to stick it down. it roughly in the middle of your page because then you can arrange the people around the outside. So the tower should stand proud and you should be able to open your door. Right, so that's the basis of your picture. Now it's time to draw the people. If you're anything like me, this spells disaster. I'm no artist, but if you start with a stick person, I promise you, it's a lot easier. First fold the A4 sheet in half along the long edge. Then fold it in the middle and then in half again. This will allow you to cut lots of people in one go. Now you're going to draw your stick person. Remember, head leaning forward, body leaning forward, and back leg kicking up 
front leg outstretched because you want a nice running action. Once you've got your basic shape, then you are ready to fill out your person. Okay, you can make your person a little bit fatter. And then you're ready to cut them out. You will end up with a nice collection of people that you can then colour in. And you need to choose nice bright colours in order to make your poster as attractive as possible. And there we have our people. Okay. I've left some that have got their hands joined together because if you noticed on this one, I've got someone reaching out from the tower, helping someone to come in to that place of safety. You just need to colour in your people and then you can put them on to your poster. If you use blue tack, then you can move them around and you can actually get them to go into the tower where they can be nice and safe. Like so. I hope you have fun making this and that it will help you to remember how God is like a strong tower to us. And don't forget to send us some pictures of your posters. Well, yesterday was a very special day for two members of our fellowship. In fact, they've done you a little video. Here it is. Hi all, thanks for all your prayers for today. Hi. By the time you've seen this, we will be Mr. And Mrs. Paul. Paul. Isn't that fantastic? Mr. and Mrs. Paul finally, after having to wait so many months after coronavirus suspended their wedding for their planned time. But we give thanks uh, that that was able to go ahead yesterday. Uh, and you can see also there a picture of how they are so happy and smiley together. We also want to celebrate with Mike Thompson, uh, who this month has turned 90. And want to say happy birthday, Mike. Congratulations. And we do wish you many more happy years. Coming up, uh, advertised in our newsletter, I've been speaking about Genexis. Now, a number of you will know about Genexis, uh, a uh, project seeking to present evidence for our Creator God. Uh, not just to those who don't know uh, Jesus, but also to those uh, within the church who maybe want to upskill their knowledge uh, and to be able to think about how best to present the evidence that is out there. Uh, now there's a seven week course going to be happening from the 5th of October. Uh, it's going to be online, there's going to be a little presentation followed by uh, a small group uh, gathering on Zoom where you can have a discussion about what has been said. Uh, if that's of interest to you, uh, then can you get in touch with me by the end of Sunday uh, so that I know whether as a church we want to be signing up for this and hosting a group or whether we'll just be praying for this uh, at this time uh, as a community. Uh, the speakers are top end speakers in all fields uh, around evidence to do with creation. Uh, and so it was really brilliant last year. Uh, and so if that's of interest, do get in touch uh, with me as soon as you can. Similarly, uh, we've been thinking about uh, our Thursday prayers uh, and whether we can do those on Zoom. Uh, I know that uh, Zoom is not what everybody uses. And so if you could just let me know whether that would be of interest to you and then I can gauge whether it's a worthwhile uh, gathering to enable or whether we need to think again about how we uh, do that. So let's take some of these elements and uh, many other things that are going on in our world and let's turn to prayer. Father God, we want to thank you for the joy of Christian marriage. And we lift up to you Joey and Sarah as they spend uh, their first couple of days as Mr and Mrs Paul. May these be full of joy and happiness. 
May they know of your faithfulness and love for them. And may they be uh, a great witness to their friends and family in all that they do. May they continue to grow as disciples of yours and bring you glory. We also think of uh, Mike and we want to praise you for uh, many more years of life. Lord, thank you for uh, this 90th birthday, a very special birthday this month. Uh, may he be blessed. May he know the love of his family and friends around him in all that he does. Lord, we move to thinking about those who are preparing to move. Uh, in particular, uh, we think of Mike and Francis Thompson and also Eleanor, as, uh, Eleanor Robson as they uh, seek to sell their houses and move to uh, other parts of the country. Father, thank you for your hand in guiding them and blessing them and giving them strength to make the decisions they have. Uh, Lord, would you uh, enable these uh, moves to go without hitch and to continue as is needed. Similarly, uh, we think of Mark and Claire Leonard and Gracie. Lord, as they wait on these new housing developments, uh, which they've been waiting so long for, uh, their new home. Uh, and so we just pray, Lord, for the date that they've been given to be uh, set in stone. Uh, and Lord, that uh, it would, they would keep calm and would just be at peace with what is going on right now. Father, we thank you for Liz and Andrew and the way that they have led the Christianity Explore course. We thank you for the way that it has had such a positive effect on those who have uh, attended. And Lord, we do pray for your blessing and your Holy Spirit to anoint them uh, in their uh, continued uh, learning about who you are. And Lord, about their commitment to you as their Lord and Saviour. Might you continue to grow them and might they continue to be overwhelmed by your great love for them. Father, you know that within our congregation we also have people who are unwell, who are awaiting test results, who have had test results which are not how they expected, and there's others who are finding life uh, very difficult at the moment through varying circumstances. Father, we lift all these people up to you, knowing that you are a healing God, you are a God who promises to be present in everything and everyone. And so we thank you that we can trust that to you. And we pray that they would know our compassion and that we would be your hands and feet where we can help. And that they would know your peace in the waiting and in the confirmation of whatever is going on. Lord, we thank you for the uh, Genexis team and we thank you for Ben Jacobs in his leadership of that organisation. We thank you for the way it seeks to reach out and share Jesus with other people. Uh, and we pray that you would set on our hearts whether this is something that we uh, should be involved in this time round. Lord, would you guide our thoughts? Would you help us to know how best uh, we can grow as disciples of yours and whether there's anyone we need to invite along lord would you bless the um planning and the organization that's going on in these last couple of weeks uh, and would you be in the center of all that technology which is going to enable so many more people to find out such truth about how amazing you are and how uh, there is uh, evidence which supports this uh, true faith and Father, as we lift our eyes uh, to the wider world, our hearts turn to the wildfires raging in California and uh, Washington and that area, Oregon. For the last three weeks now, Lord, people have uh, been in the midst of blazes which have burned millions of acres of land, destroyed thousands of homes and killed at least 25 people. Father, we also know there's uh, some people linked with our church who live in those uh, in one of those areas. Uh, Father, we pray your protection uh, especially upon them uh, and upon uh, uh, their family as their concerns and their prayers uh, are firmly with them at this time. Lord, we recognise that uh, much of this is due to our misuse of your world. And so we seek your forgiveness, Lord, and ask that you would help us to know how we can uh, better 
utilise what you have given us, how we can better care for it, steward it in the way that you call us to do. And Father, uh, would you give great wisdom to all the firefighting teams and the emergency services, the <clears throat> the organisations who are, are working to support those thousands of people who are who are displaced because of evacuation, who are affected by smoke pollution. Lord God, would you use your church over there to be places of sanctuary, <clears throat> to bring about uh, conversations of knowing that you are the safety, the place they can run to and know that they find security. And Lord, would you give wisdom to the leaders of those areas that they might know the best way to respond and to protect their people who you have incared to them. Lord, with uh, the coronavirus now having taken 9,911,877 9 people, our hearts cry out to you once again that you would bring an end to this virus. Lord, we thank you for the work which is being done on a vaccine and the changes, uh, sorry, the progress that is happening there. Lord, we thank you that you are clearly working through different people uh, to make a difference for people to reach out. Lord, we recognise that this virus shakes our mortality and has opened the door for more conversations about who you are and the difference you make. May we be bold in using these opportunities, not to lord it over people, but to share the hope which is found in Jesus. And particularly we pray for our own country, Lord, as uh, there is a spread of, of coronavirus starting again, as uh, it, it causes upset and uh, resentment in people as lockdown starts to happen in varying areas. Lord, we pray for the rising cases of deaths in India, Brazil, Argentina, USA and Ecuador. Lord Father, that it's just so hard to know what to pray. But Lord, bring your peace in those situations. And finally, Lord, uh, we bring to you the 13,000 in the Moira refugee camp on the Greek island of Lesbos. Lord, um, next week you know we're going to be spending some time thinking about this uh, particular uh, crisis uh, through someone who is has a link in, in that uh, refugee camp. Uh, but for now, Lord, we still lift them up to you. We pray for uh, those 400 children who have been uh, taken in by various uh, 10 different European countries, Lord, that uh, uh, they would settle fast and would know comfort and peace. Lord, indeed, that you would put them in places of safety and protect them as they find new homes. And Lord, as local residents are being reportedly uh, blocking aid getting through, we pray that you would open a path to enable these people to receive food and water, to receive uh, good care, uh, Lord, in the waiting, in all that is going on. So, Father, in all these things, we offer, to them, offer them to you, knowing that you are a faithful God, that you have wisdom beyond ours, that you hear the words that our hearts and our minds can't even uh, uh, come, come up with. Lord, thank you that you see the depths of our hearts and that you answer in your wisdom. So we commit all these to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we begin a new series for this autumn term, looking together through John's Gospel. Now, according to one saying, this Gospel is like a pool that's safe for a child to paddle in but deep enough for an elephant to swim in. So I hope we'll find something in here for everyone. And following on from your feedback about services, uh, each preacher will continue to offer a few questions to aid your reflection each week. Perhaps they might also be helpful to your house group. And for those who want to dig that little bit deeper, 
I'll also continue as best I can to produce some further study material around the same passage. And as always, these resources can be found on our church website, either on the house group page or Sunday gathering page. There's a link in the description below this YouTube video if you've gone directly there so that you can find those too. Now it's fair to say that John's Gospel can seem imposing to some with its lofty language and imagery. It certainly uses a different approach to the other three Gospels and that's probably because it's written after them, sometime between AD 70 to 90. And because it's written later, it's almost a given that the author is aware of the other accounts circulating, and so, inspired by the Holy Spirit, decides to take a different angle. One which is written by a very close friend of Jesus, who witnesses the events he writes about, probably the Apostle John. But unlike the other Gospels, which are written almost in the moment, it's clear that this Gospel, John's, is writing looking back, following several years of reflection as he's prayed and pondered on what he's seen, heard and experienced in light of Jesus' life, death and resurrection. In effect, John wants to help others understand the significant spiritual realities of Jesus. And so, just like any other author, John paints us a picture using a unique approach. Through use of imagery to communicate Old Testament themes rather than quotes, drawing on the Jewish feasts and temple worship to underscore the actions of Jesus in all their spiritual depth and splendour. And he seeks to communicate not just to the Jews or to the Gentiles, but to anyone in the whole of the world. For this aim is affirmed, tucked away right at the end of his Gospel, in chapter 20, verse 30, where he says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that's why I've titled this series, Come and See. For this is the invitation John's Gospel offers time and again, for all to come and see what Jesus has done and discover or be reminded of the eternal life that is so freely available for all who will believe in his name. And so, as we prepare to dig into the prologue of this amazing book, let's prayerfully invite the Holy Spirit to guide our time through our next song. Gentleness 
Today's reading is from John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, he came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognise him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified concerning him. He cried out, saying, this is the one I spoke about when I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Out of his fullness we have all received grace, in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God, and is in the closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. I wonder if you know the musical West Side Story. Inspired by Shakespeare's play, Romeo and Juliet, it hit Broadway in 1957, receiving much praise before being adapted for film in 1961. Now, whilst it clearly shines with brilliance throughout all its production... It's the song called Tonight we encounter near the end of Act 1 I want to mention today. For here, Sondheim and Bernstein gradually introduce five different themes of different perspectives of an impending fight that all think will end in their favour. One by one, they've introduced before gradually overlapping, entwining and 
building in tension towards that main event itself. It's quite simply a masterpiece of ensemble. And this is what we find John's Gospel doing today and starting in our verses. His opening prologue. It's almost like an overture as he lays out various themes that he's going to expand throughout his Gospel. And unlike the other Gospels, which either begin in Bethlehem, taking us to the cradle and the manger, or place Jesus in the line of King David, or show Jesus fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, John starts his delving back into the mists of eternity, evoking images from before creation, using those words found at the very start of the Bible in Genesis 1, in the beginning. Now, there's so much we could talk about here, but let's just draw out three themes for today. The first of which is Jesus Christ is the Word of God. Now, if we think about Genesis 1 for a moment, we find that it is when God speaks that things are created. It's his word that makes the difference that goes out from him and brings life. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, we hear of God creating the world by his word. How his word powerfully accomplishes his will in Isaiah and Psalms. And how the word of God gives understanding or wisdom to the prophets concerning the mind and will of God in Isaiah, Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Quite simply, this term logos was one that appealed not only to the Jews, but also to the Greeks alike. But more importantly than its background was John's assertion that Jesus is the word. He is God's way of communicating with us. Like the speech bubble that you see in a cartoon, Jesus is the word proceeding from God. Jesus is God, both seen and heard. (coughs) But it's important to note that John isn't just saying Jesus is a representative of God, like an agent through whom we see the divine life shining, one with the Father in purpose and love, but not in his being or nature. Far from it. Rather, John strongly asserts that Jesus is the eternal word, that he was with God in the beginning. Whenever we set our timeline, we find Jesus is also present with God, as he is God. As one ancient theologian put it, there never was when he was not. And why does this matter? Well, because that means if we look at Jesus and see God, then when we look at God, we must see Jesus. When God speaks in the Old Testament, entering into a covenant with his people Israel, inspiring and moving the prophets, this was none other than the God known in Jesus Christ. He's not changed or evolved, as Hebrews tells us. He is the same yesterday, today and forever. And of course this takes us into that greatest mystery that is the Trinity. For if he is eternal word, then he is also the creative word. Verse 3 tells us that through him all things were made, without him nothing was made that has been made. Well that's pretty clear. Jesus is not a created being like you or me. For if all things were created through Jesus Christ, then that is impossible. And so watch out for those moments throughout John's Gospel when Jesus demonstrates his power through and over creation. These are more allusions to this great truth, that theme of the overture running through his masterpiece. For this eternal and creative word also became the incarnate word. Not as a spirit or as a ghost or any other possible illusion, but as the physical person of Jesus in the flesh, living and walking amongst his creation and facing the realities of what we face each and every day. 
That's why John points to Jesus being tired or hungry or showing emotion or other such human qualities throughout his gospel. These are not minor points he's making, but rather he's drawing our attention to the reality of Jesus' humanity. To underline that he's a real person who could be touched, seen and heard. And so already you can hear the various melodies being played as John proclaims that Jesus Christ is the word of God. Of course, the word in the beginning didn't just make everything and leave it. But Jesus Christ is also the life, the sustainer of all things. Here in verse 4, John tells us that the word is the life giver, the light to all humanity. And this is another image being drawn from the dawn of creation as darkness and light are cast in opposition to one another. But the reality is, when we consider the essentials for human life, we find light alongside food, water and air. Now, as we journey through this gospel, we're going to find each of those elements assigned to Jesus as John reflects on all those exposed to the light and offered life but who chose darkness instead, either by not understanding what Jesus is saying and doing, or by choosing not to follow him, and consequently opposing him. And even when the Jews are exposed to this one true light they've been waiting for, many choose to reject it in favour of copies of the light. Lights such as the law, the temple and the sacrifices, designed to point towards Jesus as the Messiah, now become preferred to the true gift of grace and truth and fulfilment of the Old Testament found in Jesus. And despite seeing his works and hearing his words, observing his perfect life and meeting many witnesses who are transformed by his grace, they still reject it. When invited to come and see, to grasp the truth, believe and be saved by being spiritually born again, They turn away, they do not believe, and eventually kill him. Yet the light of the world they try to put out still shines. And he still offers life to all who will receive him personally and become a child of God. Have you done this yet? And this brings us back to the root of John's Gospel that he writes to convince his listeners of the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That it's only in him that God is revealed to us, for he is the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1 verse 15, and the express image of his person, Hebrews 1 verse 3. Simply put, we cannot understand God apart from knowing his Son, Jesus Christ. For it's in him that grace and truth reach their fullness, and this fullness is offered to us all. As we are saved by grace, we live by grace, and we depend on God's grace in all that we do. Friends, these are extraordinary themes and truths that will appear time and again interweaved throughout this gospel, sometimes in a prominent position and at other times just alluded to. But just like a master orchestrator, if you take the time to listen, you'll be amazed by the ways John develops and asserts these truths, supporting them with the signs that point to Jesus' divinity. And so, is this just a very clever piece of writing? Or does it have any relevance for us today? Well, I'd like to suggest that in our world of increasing pluralism, it can become increasingly uh, easy to feel under pressure to water down our understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done. It's therefore even more important to ensure that we are well rooted in our recognition that Jesus is not just another man, or even a great wise man, or even just the figurehead of the Christian church, but that he's fully God and yet 
also became fully human. That he is the one with God in his being, in his infinity and limitlessness. Infinity and limitlessness. Yet he is also knowable as the one who came to live amongst us and make a way for us to have life in all its fullness. In essence, this passage seeks to exhort the name of Jesus Christ to the place where it belongs, beyond our understanding in such a way that we are driven back to worship, recognising the awesome reality and mystery before us. And this overture sets out the melodies that will now be developed throughout this amazing work with the simple invitation to come and see. So this week, I just want to encourage you to take some time to reread this passage slowly. Allow the way John speaks about Jesus to affirm these as truths in your hearts and invite the Holy Spirit to give you a greater sense of awe at who Jesus is as we come and see. You're the word of God, the Father, from before the world began. Every star and every planet has been fashioned by your hand. All creation holds together by the power of your voice. Let the skies declare your glory, let the land and seas rejoice. friends thank you for joining me today and worshipping with me wherever you are uh, if you're visiting uh, then please do uh, go to the website which is on the screen and uh, drop us a note uh, just to let us know that you've been with us it's great to hear from different people and also it helps us to be able to be praying for you as you join our community if you're of the year 7 to 11 age group don't forget that we've got the attic online session starting at 11:30. Uh, if you've missed getting the Zoom code for this time, don't panic. Uh, do send an email to uh, Summit. The email address is on the screen, the office at email address, uh, and she can make sure that you get that uh, for next time. And finally, don't forget, uh, if you're interested in either the Zoom prayer meeting or the Genexus event, then uh, drop me an email uh, so that I know, uh, particularly about the Genexus event, uh, I really need to know by the end of Sunday uh, so that I can let uh, the organisers know if we're going to be holding a group 
or not. So if that's on your mind, even if it's a maybe, uh, just drop me an email so I'm really aware of, of what's going on. For now, let me close our time together with a blessing. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Saviour be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. And may you know the blessing of that God in your life in the week ahead. Amen.